And I checked the Rikers Island site on Yelp before I came over this afternoon. They get 23 comments, 23 reviews of Rikers Island, ostensibly all of them written by former inmates as well as by family members of former inmates. And as many of you know, you can rank from one to five and it turns out Rikers Island doesn't get rave reviews on Yelp. Their average score was a two. But I raise that not just because of the oddity that it represents, but because of how much life in jail, going to jail, being in prison has become part of the everyday experience for so many families in America who have a loved one or relative uh, who's in prison uh, or uh, on, on their way to prison. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to raise for our panel and open with, um, Arizona State is at the heart of the body-worn camera movement in policing. Uh, there are a number of federal grants that are run through ASU, most of which with my colleagues, that involve over 300 communities that have put these cameras on law enforcement officers. And the early returns are that it seems to increase public confidence in the police to see a body-worn camera. It seems to deter some, not all, but some actions that the police take. Given the symbolism of Rikers Island and the other island prison that I think about is, of course, Alcatraz, which, of course, was eventually closed for many of the same reasons that Rikers Island may be. And given the need to create safer environments, Mr. Charlton, you put people in prison, you've overseen prisons. Do you think there's a time we'll see body-worn cameras on correctional officers? And since you run a jail, we'll, we'll let you have the next answer. What do you think? Um, can you hear me if I speak more? Well, I, I can't think of a reason why that wouldn't be a good idea. Um, I think uh, body cameras on law enforcement officers has improved the professionalism within the ranks of law enforcement, just as insisting that Miranda rights be given uh, in the 60s improved the professionalism within law enforcement, just as insisting that um, custodial interrogations be recorded has improved the level of professionalism. I think this is the next step in the advancement of the professionalism within the criminal justice ranks. Tracy, how about you? you you put that uniform on every day and you go behind the walls and behind the doors. What do you think about bringing body-worn cameras into your environment? I think it's a great idea. Uh, currently in our jail uh, centers, we have cameras. Um, so we're being recorded 24-7 as it is. The only thing we don't have is audio. So um, we prefer to have a body camera so that everything that we say and do is recorded. We really want to have transparency so that um, people can see what it is that we have to deal with on a daily basis. Unfortunately, for those of us that work in the jails and prisons, we don't usually, um, what we do every day is not known until it's become a media presentation. So uh, I think I can speak on behalf of Maricopa County and Sheriff Penzone that he would give um, thumbs up to have those body cams on our detention staff. Let me, I'm gonna to turn to the, our two former members of the bench, um, and I know you're anxious to weigh in on this, but the question I'd like to hear from you all from is, what do you think about judicial oversight of jails. We've seen consent decrees for police departments. Uh, we've seen agreements between police and communities to do things in a different way. If, if we might start, Judge Huberman, with you, what's the point at which it's appropriate for the courts to get involved in management of prisons and jails? Well, I'm not a former I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm currently on the bench. I'm a justice of the peace. Uh, we only deal with jails. We do not deal with prisons. Um, the level of, of um, 
of crimes that are dealt with in the justice courts only go to the jail. But obviously, being in jail has a very large impact on anyone who goes to jail. Just a five days in jail can lead someone to lose their jobs. After they lose their jobs, of course, then they're in risk of losing housing, losing their children, and everything that comes accompanied with that. So um, I think it's important for all of us to be very aware of what is happening in the jails, what happens to those people that we are either leaving in the jails or sending to the jails to do time. Well, to your question about uh, oversight by the courts, sometimes that's the only possible solution. There have been many, many cases in the state of Arizona where the federal courts have provided uh, court-ordered monitors. Uh, there's currently a major class action monitoring situation going on for medical care in the Arizona Department of Corrections, at least over the state prisons. They there have been court orders and court monitors uh, intervention by federal courts throughout the years on many, many issues. So sometimes that's what it takes. Legislatures won't step in and do what they need to do. Uh, the public generally doesn't have a great interest in prisons um, unless they have someone who is impacted by the prison system. So there's an apathy there. I've had media. Uh, people tell me that their editors will not cover stories, particularly about prisoners, because there's not enough feedback on Facebook or whatever. There's not enough empathy for prisoners. And so it sometimes results in the only recourse is the court. And Mr. Twethway, you hold a unique position among the members of the of the panel because you, you've been on the inside and speak with that knowledge and are now working on the outside both to prevent, as I understand, but as well as for transitioning individuals. When you see this, what, what are your reactions? Does this look something very different than your experience or does it resonate with the individuals you work with? Um, I, you know, I've spent nearly 13 years of my life in prison and, you know, this is, uh, this documentary is like the story of my life, um, that I've lived over and over again. And, um, you know, I, I would relate imprisonment, um, similar to a fight. I don't know how many people here have ever been in a fight, but when you're in a fight, you're getting hit and you're defending yourself and you're, you're trying to survive. You don't have time to sit there and say, um, oh wow, that hurts, hold on. You know, you have to get through it. So you don't really feel it when you're going through it. And um, all these stories that were talked about in this documentary um, of this extreme violence that takes place, um, People may seem callous, but when you're going through that trauma, you don't have time to sit there and think about what's going on. You're, you're living through it. So when people get out, um, oftentimes that's when they really start to feel the impact of it when they're out here. And it floods on, and all these emotions from all of the traumas, all of the violence, all of the things that you've seen um, uh, come on you very heavy and it makes it very difficult to function in society. Um, and a lot of people suffer from psychological disorders and uh, PTSD and complex trauma as a result. And I think that that's one of the key components of the difficulties with the prison system, the way that it is. So, you know, you're talking about um, more monitoring uh, within the prisons. I think that that, you know, may um, cause some um, benefit. Um, but the system in itself is the problem. It's creating these conditions. It's a survivalist environment. And I think that we can see from this documentary that the, these individuals, we can relate to them when we're listening to them talk. When you're listening to me speak, you can say, well, he's not that bad of a guy. You know, he seems like a normal person. But, you know, if you look at my history, um, on, on, on paper, I look like Satan. But if you get to know me, you know that I'm a good person. And, um, but that environment 
forces you to uh, take on this personality in order to survive it, and, and you become conditioned for that environment. And that makes it very difficult to transition out here. So I would say, though those things may be beneficial, um, the reality is we have to change the way the system is designed. I'd, I'd like to follow up on that, if I may. It, look, it, it, the closing of Rikers is an absolutely um, tremendous, uh, it, it's a tremendous symbolic gesture. But every single jail and prison is an island. When you look at the concertina wire and the cell and those slamming steel doors and the sally ports and the effort that it takes to get inside a prison if you want to examine what's going on there, you need to understand that those fences around prisons are put there as much to keep you out as to keep the prisoners in. And when people go to prisons, legislators, visitors, volunteers, et cetera, they get a very, um, they get a very dog and pony show view of what really goes on in those prisons. They don't get the real picture because if they did, there would be a lot more opposition to what goes on. Mr. Lefevre, I, I wanna ask if you could Tell us a little bit about, from, from where you sit as director of the Criminal Justice Commission, what are we doing in Arizona for transition, for inmates who are coming out of prison, in particular, although jail, um, for reentry process? Where do things stand in Arizona? Thank you. So, uh, you know, the, the, the unfortunate circumstances of what happens when somebody is incarcerated um, is what it is, and we saw that in the in the in the film, and 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 I I, I think that's very common. <clears throat> I think what we as a society need to start looking at is, you know, Mr. Moyer said we have five percent of the world's population, but twenty five percent of the world's prison population are incarcerated individuals. Well, we also have eighty five percent of the world's use of prescription medications in this country, and we have this whole situation of folks that are entering, 70% of the people that come into prisons and jails in our country have some type of substance abuse problem. Uh, there's te people with mental illnesses are 10 times more likely to be in prison than not, than folks without mental illness. We as a society need to begin addressing those situations before somebody comes in contact with our criminal justice system and after they leave the criminal justice system. It's just not fair to expect jails and prisons to correct somebody's mental illness for good or their substance abuse for good. It's just not going to happen. Um, the governor, Governor Ducey, has made uh, recidivism reduction one of his cabinet level initiatives for Arizona. And uh, we've begun working on that in conjunction with the Department of Corrections, Department of Housing, uh, Access, which is our Medicaid provider, uh, DES, which is our employment provider, to try and figure out how we as a state can do a better job of providing the kinds of services and, and, and situations that will help make folks more successful as they begin to transition out of the state facilities. And we're hopeful that if we're able to come up with a model that seems to make sense and reduces that 40% number down and begins to, to, to relieve that pressure on the number of folks that are incarcerated in our safe, that we can begin to do that at the county level as well. But it's got to be a holistic approach. It can't be just what happens with inside the walls. Let me uh, pause at this moment to bring Bill Moyers back on up here, if we could. We got a, we got a nice, comfortable them, chair for you. One of them said something I'd like to hear amplified. And uh, then we'll get questions from the audience. I think the other thing is, um, you know, to put American prisons in context, um, the French in 1831 sent a team of historians and writers to America to study prisons because the new republic in France thought this was a wonderful experiment that this was a way to expand democracy to people who hadn't been included in the democratic movement. And the, he wasn't famous then, but Alexis de Tocqueville wrote a two volume his, history of America. We were less than 60 years old, so I guess it would have been 
shorter than somebody who wrote such a thing today. But a major focus of the new democracy in, Mer in America was on prisons and how prisons were to re-socialize citizens to be able to be fully participants in democracy. And of course, as you know now, if you've gone to prison in America, the likelihood is you've been disenfranchised and you're likely not gonna be able, gonna be able to vote. Uh, so why don't we look to the audience who's patiently watched and, and listened and see if there are questions that you would wanna ask to members of the panel. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm supposed to say please come to the microphone because this is being recorded. And so if we get a short cue, that would be good. Um, I, I really don't have questions so much as my observations from watching the film. And that was, I said, what about the correctional officers? And I thought of the book by Joseph Conrad, uh, Heart of Darkness. I mean, they're going into the belly of the beast, too, and it's affecting them as well, you know, that they have to deal with it. And it's, I believe that prison environment, the jail environment, also affects them personally, and they get changed. Somebody always mentioned that when they were leaving the jails, how they were feeling that they couldn't integrate back into society. Somebody already mentioned post-traumatic stress disorder. I think we need to do more about that area. Um, the other thing is, I forgot the name of the film, but Michael Moore, the latest film, he showed. Hmm? Where do we invade next? Where, where do we invade next? Great film. And he showed this, how they treat prisoners in the Netherlands. And it was such a humane way of treating them. And my last comment is, I don't think we're going to be able to put a dent in this until we have a complete and absolute war on poverty. Uh, say that again, until what? Hmm? A complete, complete and, and absolute, absolute war. war on poverty. Well, uh, incarceration falls hardest on poor people. I, I think everybody on this panel would say that. Incarceration falls hardest on poor people, and it falls hardest on people of color. Uh, not that there aren't you know, poor whites and all of that. It falls hard on poor whites as well. Poverty is a, nur a nursery for much of the behavior, including mental illness and need, uh, that, that uh, produces the, the tendency to commit a crime. But it does fall heavily on okay. the poor. I'm gonna impose a two minute limit. Two minutes, oh my goodness. Okay, I'm Sue Ellen Allen, and I lived in prison out at Perryville for seven years. Hi, Brother in Orange. So it doesn't just fall on poor people, it falls on a lot of people. One in three people in America now has a criminal record. And as a member, I run a nonprofit and I know that nothing is going to change in America or in Arizona until the general public starts speaking out and saying, this is enough. Because the governor can do, can do all these wonderful things with smoke and mirrors, but when you ask DOC, oh, that sounds like a great program. How many people are eligible for that program? How many seats do you have? 19, 20, there are 43,000 inmates. So, you know, the, the numbers are tiny and we are dropping, we're spitting in the ocean. It's, it's hitting everybody. And now white people need to be scared because white privilege is going away and white people need to be scared too. Look at this wonderful panel. And I'm a privileged white woman, but I went to prison. And if you had told me what I was gonna see and experience there, I would have said, not in my country. That doesn't happen in my country. It does, I was wrong. So I'm having a, a probation simulation in a couple of weeks, and if anybody wants to find out what it's really like to get out of prison, come and see me afterwards and find out for yourself. Mr. Mars, thank you so much for being here. It means a lot. Thank Could you. I just respond to something. I, I, I just want to say, look, we're, the tide is maybe starting to turn a little bit in Arizona, and we did have the governor announce some focus that's going on reentry programming. But I have to tell you, uh, in our view, and we deal with hundreds, thousands of prisoners and their families every single day since 1983. 
They're chasing the money. Congress established money and grants that are coming down through the Second Chance Act and some other places. And I have to tell you, and maybe I'm cynical, I'll wear that badge, but if Congress decided this year that a best practice study showed that recidivism could redu be reduced by prisoners who learned how to make sushi, then you would see programs that taught prisoners how to make sushi, okay? Because they're chasing the money. And if the money decides to go somewhere else, then recidivism and reentry stuff goes poof. Because right now, we don't, we don't try to help people all that much while they're in prison with their reentry. Instead, because of funding, we wait until they get out of prison start to fail, and then we put them for 90 days in a reentry center out at Adobe Mountain or down in Tucson, and we pay for 90 more days of essentially what is incarceration after they've gotten out of prison. The logic of that escapes me. Why we don't do that, why we don't use these best practices and all these intensive cognitive therapy best practice programs while they're in prison is beyond me. Briefly, and then we're gonna move through the line. I, I just wanna talk about the jail portion of it, which is, because as, as they said in the, in the film about Rikers, it was most of the people who were in Rikers had not yet been sentenced. So these are all, folks who are still um, pre-adjudication. What we're doing here in Arizona and the, 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 the Supreme Court and the courts, and, and I can speak specifically for the courts of Maricopa, is that we are trying to work to try to keep people out of jail in the first place. To try to reduce the, about the warrants, especially in the justice courts, we issue a lot of warrants based on non-payment of fines. So talk about poor people who go to, to jail, right? And so we're trying to avoid the issuing as many warrants for non-payment, trying to find alternatives and, and make shorter terms of incarceration to avoid these type of problems. Please, may, before you do yep. that, may I just respond to the previous uh, questioner who made a remark about, you know, that there were no corrections officers in this film. That was deliberate uh, because, as I said earlier, I've seen no films that tell the story from the inmate side. I've seen many films with, in New York in particular, where we have so many of these issues with, with corrections officers in them. I have incredible sympathy for corrections officers. You heard some of these inmates say their brothers and sisters and cousins and mothers and others were corrections officers and that the only difference is one of them has a uniform and the other one doesn't. One is guarding one and the other isn't. There, it is true that, that, that they have a terrific job they are agents, a difficult job, correction officer. They are agents of the state, however. They have the power of the state backing them up. When you're in there at their mercy, you don't have that, that, that power. And the stories are often different when you can tell them without a corrections officer around. But I, corrections officers suffer too from our institutionalized prison issue problem. Mayor de Blasio is going to have a very difficult time. This independent commission that I've actually fastened on this film very early, and they've been using it in all their hearings, they have recommended that Rikers be closed. The mayor says he supports that it will take at least 10 years and probably is going to be very difficult to achieve because the idea is to spread smaller jails throughout the city, and there isn't a neighborhood in New York that wants that to happen. And the... Uh, the uh, uh, Corrections Union says the proposal is laughable. All change comes hard in a democracy. And the issue that, that, that Rikers and every prison in America raises is this. Is it impossible any longer for democracy to solve the problems it creates for itself? It may be, and if it is, we're done. But if, unless we find a way to tackle this very serious issue, which you said Beaumont and, and Tocqueville were sent here to, uh, to, to uh, look at in the 1830s, unless we solve this, we're going to be living half slave and half free, and Lincoln said that can't be. We cannot exist as a civilization if we have two, three million of our people in prisons just down 
road. It can't and won't be. Please. Uh, I'm Dave Wells. I, I teach here, but I'm also the research director for the Grand Canyon Institute, and we've done some criminal justice work. Um, we may have things that we can learn from New York. Uh, New York has half the incarceration rate that Arizona does. We have the fifth highest incarceration rate in the country. Uh, if we go back 20 years, we spent multiple times more on universities than we did on prisons. And today we spend way more on prisons than we do on universities. Uh, and I think uh, we need to really fundamentally uh, re-examine uh, some of those uh, key aspects about where things are. One way, way in which Arizona is way off is that we're the only state in the entire country that applies truth and sentencing to nonviolent offenders, uh, which means that they have to serve at least 85% of their sentence. Uh, we had put out a report back in 2012 uh, arguing that we should at least apply earned release. Uh, we should do that to everybody, but I think especially nonviolent offenders, and really emphasize, because it, you, there's, the, imprisoning people does not lower your, your crime rate. Uh, there's no evidence for that. Uh, and I think it's much more cost effective to actually provide more treatment for people, as Donna was talking about, in a community setting. Uh, or in prisons, because right now we're doing it actually on the cheap. We barely spend enough money to just pay to incarcerate people. We don't have money to do any of the other programming. Tell us where we can find that report. Uh, you can go to GrandCanyonInstitute.org. Grand I have read it, by the way. I, I think Great. you're a yeah. terrific Thank outfit, you. and I, I like you your work. Thank you very much. Please. This has me wondering about private prisons. Uh, since they are a business, that leads me to conclude that there has to be some minimum level of occupancy in these places when they negotiate the contracts. And he kind of touched on it in his question. How does that keep, what's preventing our justice system from becoming a contract fulfillment mechanism? Well, let me. Let, let me tell you that um, I was in federal law enforcement for 16 years, and I was then and still am of a firm mind that there are some things that only the government should be in charge of, our military, our police, and our prisons. You cannot put a profit motive uh, in front of people who are running our prisons. Um, and that's, um, that's true for our police, and that's true for our military. There are some things for all of its many problems about which our government does better than private industry does, and that's the way it really should be. Let's hear from Mr. Trethway, and then we'll move on to the next question. We got people lined up, and I don't think we have the room past midnight. Um, what, I, what I would add to that is that, you know, there is this uh, a lot of talk about private prisons because it's in your face that it's for-profit imprisonment. But the reality is, I would say just as much, if not more, um, capital is made off of state and federal prisons um, by way of everything being contracted to, to um, um, uh, and privatized, and um, including the, the labor. So lots of corporations make millions and billions of dollars from taxpayers off of people being in prison. So, I mean, it, it, when the, the, the reality is is that the entire system, the way that it is now functioning, um, can only create a problem um, that we see and can only cause it um, to continue to grow. So we need, uh, you know, people go into prison because most times they have an issue. They go into prison and leave with a lot more issues. We need to be addressing their issues. That's what incarceration and corrections should be about, so that they can come out and be better people. And uh, me and uh, my fellow co-founder of Atlas Justice Center, um, Kirsten Neidenbach, we have designed an alternative corrections model that we will be doing a presentation about in May in Dallas, Texas, um, that we call Sure Camps, um, that does this. And, and, and it will be much more cost effective to uh, our society and even more so in the, in the, long, in the long run. So, uh, nobody but, directly answered the gentleman's question. Arizona started off with a 90% occupancy rate guarantee on their prison, private prison contracts. They are now at 100% occupancy so that uh, 
to the best of my knowledge, to the most recent prison, private prison contracts that have been negotiated guarantee 100% occupancy. So that's why you see the legislature not reducing the criminal code from 85% down to anything else because they got to fill those beds, they're paying for them. I, I think that's a strong motive. And I will just add, like you, we're not necessarily opposed to private prisons. In fact, our mailbag from prisoners tells us that the private prisons, except for medical care, which is horrible everywhere, are better than the state-operated prisons on many levels. But what needs to happen is there needs to be an incentive-based uh, put into the contracts so that they produce results, lower recidivism, and that's when they get their their bonus or their pay. I have a new appreciation for TV hosts who can get the conversation moving and keep the line going. <laughs> Please. Marty Wilson, I'm just a regular um, citizen. I had, Never put just yeah, in front true, of regular. True, I'm a regular citizen here wanting to learn more. And from the programs, I just wondered what can be done. I know that we have a culture of fear. The more we are afraid of the other, the bad guys, the, the more we want to close them out of our lives. And then we end up building up the prison population. But what are the programs? Uh, it happens so quickly. What are the programs represented here? And even for uh, the gentleman that's also a part of the system, uh, what are the programs that are helpful to reduce recidivism and to help people with mental health issues or to help the system? And what can we do volunteering? What do people do? What's happening? Director Lefevre, could we start with you? Well, I mean, there's definitely a focus being placed on the reentry process. Um, it is something that needs to be looked at and a better job done to make sure that folks are coming out of prison with a plan um, to make sure that those services are available. You know, it, quite oftentimes we have folks coming out of prison that don't have their driver's license or don't have their health care um, taken care of. Uh, we're releasing folks homeless out of prison onto the streets because they don't have a place to live. Um, that's just not set up for folks to be successful. Um, so we are certainly trying to look at how do we bring those factors to the folks in the prisons before they're coming out so that as they're in that last 120, 90 day period that they're trying to get those services lined up so that they come out with some support system in place. The next step beyond that is going to be how do we engage the community so that when they're coming back into their community, the faith-based communities there, uh, families there, services are there to, to help give them that support system that they need. It, it's something we're looking at. It's a, a very tough road to hoe, but you know, the, the, the not in my backyard problem is a huge problem. You know, we could have the greatest programs and who's going to raise their hand and say, yes, let's put that in my neighborhood. Chief Haggard, what would you say to citizens who would like to do something or help with the jail or be involved or are there roles, are there student internships? What, what are the options that are available? Can I go back to the um, programs that we have inside our facilities? We certainly have faith-based programs. We have um, alcohol, like AA, um, Narcotics Anonymous. We have programs that we have volunteers that come in. We train them. Um, we clear them. And they're average citizens. They come in and then they uh, host these programs and they teach. But, but more importantly, we are, Maricopa County does have programs in place for transitioning back into community. And what we're doing is, is when you are arrested and you're interviewed by our classification specialists, they'll do something what's car called an RRS, which is risk to, risk to recidivate score. And it's based on three questions, and that's your current age, your um, age when you were first arrested, and I just went blank on what the, oh, and the uh, number of times that you've been arrested. And they take that score 
and its um, numerical value, and then wherever you rate on that scale is where you are a low risk offender, a medium risk, or high offender, high risk offender. And what we're doing is we're establishing programs based on those high risk offenders because of we found out that if they are not um, given the right resources and the tools, that they will come right back. So we have a remarkable program. It's a 24 week program called Thinking for a Change, and it's giving our individuals um, skills that they need. Um, so that's, uh, we have smart justice with Maricopa County. We have, um, I, I believe the judge talked about um, fair justice, which is what we're looking at for bonds and lowering our bonds. But as far as citizens, um, we're, we open our doors for tours. We'll give you tours inside our facility. We do have volunteer programs. So we are always looking for help to come in, um, whether that is helping with our education program, whether that is with our face excuse me, faith-based programs um, or uh, like literacy programs, teaching to individuals to read. We, we have it. If you want afterwards, I'll give you a contact number and then we can go from there. Super. But Thank let's you. move to the next question and the other then. Program, but the other programs from outside the system, what are you guys doing? Well, I'm, I'm a judge, so I'm not outside the system. I'm okay. inside the system. We're working with the fair justice, right. trying to reduce it people getting into jail in the first place. And we're not, we're not a social service agency. We're a legal organization that protects the rights of people who are incarcerated and on probation, both in jail and prison. So we work to get medical care, protective custody, visitation, those kinds of things. Um, Maybe this is something that just a citizen could do. Maybe there needs to be a website in Arizona. Right, a clearinghouse. That try, a clearinghouse that just doesn't try to run anything, but just tries to connect citizens to all the organizations or some of the organizations, list all of them and how to get in touch with them and what they're doing and what you can do. That, that sounds some, great. Just a citizen okay, can do that. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I Just briefly, um, my organization has um, created a program, um, ID. It's an institutional detox. And with all due respect, you know, 13 years in prison, I've been through all the different programs that they offer, and, and they don't really address the issues or help or provide you with any skills, and they don't work. If they did, we wouldn't be here. Um, but, but one of the main things that they miss is the, the trauma that imprisonment causes itself. It conditions you to be a prisoner. So how do you go from being a prisoner that's completely upside down world from what we see out here um, to being out here with absolutely no help, tons of societal obstacles, um, and, and expected to function well. So our program briefly really addresses those things and helps, um, helps those individuals uh, design a map that shows them how to get from where they are now to where they want to be in life and also uh, provides some psychoeducation. Sorry. Will be our final question. Yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> my name is Irving Rob, and uh, I'm I'm not really a student at this time. Um, I'm from Indiana, and I've never been touched with the law at all. My thing is private. Well, a couple things I have to say before I come to my total hey, question sure. is for all the comments that I heard before I came up to ask question. One, private prisons are used for companies to make money off of. That's why you're losing jobs. Another thing is um, <clears throat> that the system needs to teach uh, correctional officers not to be military officers and teach them how to be counselors. That's another issue. N another thing is, yes, programs do need to be in place inside the jail. And another thing is also, they shouldn't make the jail look so deadly. That's, that, that, that puts them, that puts fear in them and fear that they will never come out in life. So when they do come out into a new society and see everything, they don't know how to deal because they've seen death in the face already. So in their mind, it's, it's living isn't there already. So there needs to be a new atmosphere in place and not just programs to, to help people. And if you need a program, program should teach people how to still become friendly with people. It should be, they should have different programs to learn how to communicate, not just uh, get rid of alcohol or that doesn't do anything for anybody. It, the, pro, the, the programs that they have in place isn't really helping anything when they come out of prisons because they don't know how to handle things. So my main question is, 
do you really think that jails will be died down like Rikers? Or do you think or you think they should actually try to reform them to a prison like Sweden has and other countries that's in Europe? Why don't we let our guest provide us with his insights about the future of jails in America? Well, I'm a reporter, not a prophet, uh, and, and I don't know, but I do think we are reaching uh, the end of our patience with an overpopulated prison system, and a, one that takes a huge toll on human beings and a huge toll on state budgets. You know, most of the prisons, as I said, are state institutions, and uh, here I believe uh, in Arizona, uh, your uh, prison population has risen 40 percent, no, your budget has risen 40 percent in the last uh, five or six years to over a billion dollars. And I, and I heard people today sitting in the hotel lobby talking to me about that. They knew what I, why I was here. There's plenty of positive things going on. Uh, I mean, uh, Oklahoma, and it's true that Trump and Jeff Sessions were elected, they're hardliners. But at that same time, there were a number of states that did a lot of, 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 of trimming of prison population. They've increased, uh, they've decreased their prison population and decreased their, their crime. There were a number of prosecutors who were elected in November, promising to reduce the number of prisons and the number of populations. Oklahoma even passed, voters in Oklahoma even passed a, um, a, a changing uh, felony uh, drug use to misdemeanor drug use, uh, soft marijuana, that sort of thing. There, were, there were, must have been three score of very positive results from the election, all of which got um, uh, blown away and ignored because of, of Donald Trump's triumph. In Washington, before the election, there were a, a covey of Democrats and Republicans who were getting together to see if they could come up with bipartisan uh, reforms in, in Congress. And several Republican senators have already, in this, in this term, uh, introduce some reforms in the Senate with Democratic backing. I, it, nothing has emerged, it, the sculpture hasn't appeared, but there are a lot of things at work that make me optimistic that we are at a turning in our attitude toward uh, prisons. And one of the reasons I did this film, by the way, wasn't done ex exclusively for television. It was done for this. Um, in, in part of my vision 50 years ago for public broadcasting was exactly this that the journalist would produce a program or a film or a documentary that would take the viewer as close as possible to the verifiable truth. And then people would gather to discuss what do we do about that truth. And, and, and Channel 8 is going to be broadcasting this film uh, next week, I think it is. Uh, but the real value of it comes in a session like this that people will gather and start asking the questions like you're asking, making proposals like you're making. Terrific panel, by the way. I'm glad you're taping this because I want to look at it again. But this, is, this can be the beginning. Do democracy ultimately is a conversation. We, we meet, we look face to face, we disagree, we talk about the options, and then in the interest of civility and, and civilization, we compromise. Uh, and there are people who legitimately feel Prison is where many people belong. There are people who legitimately feel that's not necessary. I see many Christians that I know, fundamentalists, not fundamentalists, but conservative Christians concerned about mercy and redemption. I see Republicans concerned about cost, and I see Democrats concerned about civil liberties. And I say, taking all of that, I see a convergence that will, is coming if we keep nurturing it this way through this means. This film was created largely to be a tool for people like all of you in this room. Its life will go on, as will the life of democracy, if people take advantage of, demo of, of opportunities like this to get together and talk through these issues and problems. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, Professor Decker and our distinguished panel for joining us this evening. Thank you all for joining us, Bill. That was an amazing wrap-up. Any other final thoughts? Or a, this this was just a, a, a fantastic conversation. This is, well, thank you for thank making you it happen. All right. Thank you all. Drive safe.